Today, by God's grace, we are bringing the final pieces together. We are bringing the man and the woman together in the scene, trying to sew a beautiful dress, trying to sew a beautiful, godly marriage. So we'll talk about the man, we'll talk about the woman, and then we fit it all together. In the context of marriage, God is the one who designed it. So God has taken his time to take out the measurements, to cut the front and the back, so that when everything is sewed together, eventually it will come out looking that perfect thing that God had in his mind. It is in this light that this morning we are about to discuss Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, so that we will see the two parts that God is trying to bring together. After he takes the measurement for the man, he takes the measurement for the woman, we see how God begins to sew them together to bring out that beautiful institution called marriage. Before we go into the word, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to give you glory this morning. We bless your holy name for the gift of life. Not everyone that went to sleep with us has the opportunity to wake up this morning. Because of that grace you've given us to be up, alive and well, we say thank you. We pray for all our listeners that Lord Jesus continue to bless them, protect and guide them and deliver them from the walls of the enemy. And today, let this broadcast be exceptionally useful and a blessing to your people. At the end of the day, take all the glory and bring your children the blessings. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God is a master designer. In the beginning, he started to sow a beautiful institution called marriage. He started to deal with the man, and then later on, he brought the woman into the scene. This is the same concept that dressmakers of our day used to come up with their designs. They have an idea in mind, they sketch it out, and then they begin to cut the clothes. But you realize that they will cut the clothes and the clothes are in pairs. Yes, when the individual parts are lying down, they have no use, there is no shape to it, there is no beauty to it, but when he or she takes his time and then begins to put them together, carefully knit them together. You realize that it comes out and it looks so beautiful and elegant and each and every single one of us is yearning to go and purchase it. That was the same thing God did with marriage. He worked on the man. He had qualities that he was looking out for. He had things that he wanted the man to be able to portray. He actually measured the man so that when the woman comes into the scene, and they are brought together as one, it will become a beautiful institution. Today, it's our desire to cut out the measurements of the man. It's our desire to cut out the measurements of the man. We take the length and the height and the chest and everything and we cut it out. But you realize that it will not fit properly until the woman is also brought into the scene and that is when we will get that perfect fit called marriage. Whatever we are going to study today, whatever you hear about the wife, whatever you hear about the husband, the foundation is that submit to one another out of reverence, out of fear, out of respect for God. So most of us in our generation are missing it because we are dealing with our spouse based on how they react but that is not supposed to be we deal with them on the premise of god's word whatever god is saying is how we live our lives in the marriage covenant in this situation bible is saying that whatever you would do as a wife whatever you would do as a husband it is not in relation to how your spouse is reacting it is in relation to the reverence or the respect you have for god so marriage, like they say, is a threefold cord which cannot be easily broken. The man is on one extreme end, the woman is on the other extreme end, and God is at the apex of it all. If you look at your wife or you look at your husband, chances are that you would misbehave. That is why God said, for you to be together, you must rather look at me. So as the man and the woman look up to God, it, it brings them together. They get to connect. Because if I look at my wife through the lens of God, I will not misbehave. 
And if she also looks at me through the lens of God, she will not misbehave. And that is how it's supposed to be. Because by the time you look at your spouse through the lens of God, chances are that your mindset will change. Your mind will be transformed. The way you wanted to deal with him or her, God would have refined it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, all the way to verse 33, describes how God designed the man and the woman to be in the context of marriage. And the verse 21 is the pillar for this study because it says that further submit to one another out of reverence for God. It means that whatever we are about to study, whatever the woman is supposed to do, whatever the man is supposed to do in return, is not based on each of them. It is based on the fear they have for God. So whatever the woman will do, whatever the man will do, it is because of the fear they have for God. Failure to do the things that have been spelled out in the verse 22 all the way to verse 30 means that we don't fear the Lord. The verse 31 also has a very salient point. It says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Another version will say, for these reasons, a man would leave his father and mother and join to the wife and cleave. For these reasons so it is not in your good interest to go and seek for a wife if those reasons have not been met you need to understand the reasons god gave for you to move so until you get the reason to write and you fully understand the context of whatever god meant there is no justification why a man should go and marry So for the wife, you should understand that the man knows those reasons. And for the man, you should know that the woman knows those reasons. Both people should know the reasons before the moving and the cleaving. Unfortunately, most of us in our generation are moving and cleaving without the reasons. And it is causing a lot of chaos in our homes. But for the godly marriage, according to how God designed it, there are reasons that needs to check out before we move and cleave and it is in that light that today we want to go into the word and find out what god actually meant for us to know before we move and cleave verse 22 bible said for wives this means submit to your husbands as to the lord and that was the end of the statement my little English that I did makes me understand that when the full stop comes, the statement is ended. If there was a comma, probably something else would have been added. But in this statement, he said, submit to your husbands as Christ submits to the church. And it seems like it's a very easy task for the woman, but I can guarantee you that it's not as easy as you are thinking. Submission is very difficult. God created the woman, God created the man, and because he knew what the woman will face, he knew what the man will face, that was why he gave the specific assignment of submission to the woman. Because women naturally have tendencies not to submit. God being the creator knows the problem with women, so he said, I'm making this a law for you, submit for your husband. If this one checks out, you will succeed in your godly marriage. Because if you want to submit based on how you are living with the man, you will make a mistake. And on the day of judgment, there will not be a question like, oh, what were the reasons why you did not submit? And you will say, my husband did that and that and that and that. And you will be pardoned. If your husband failed to play his part of the bargain and he ends up in hell and you also reacted based on the fact that he was not doing his part, you've also missed it. You must live your life not based on how your spouse is dealing with you. You must live your life based on the covenant you have with God. And in this Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, you realize that the covenant is between the woman and God, and the man and God. And then it comes together to make a beautiful peace. So I pray that wives, you will submit unconditionally. I know it's not easy. I know sometimes it's tough. The men, we do misbehave at times. But as you keep praying for us, as you keep living your life the way you should live it, God begins to work on us as well. So I encourage you not to give up. I encourage you to keep pressing on. And at the end of the day, all the glory will go to Jesus and you will have a beautifully knit 
spiritually inclined godly marriage so women don't take it for granted and think it's it's easy so whatever i'm just going to do whatever i want to do pay attention to it work on it pray for grace to be able to submit because once god has said it pay attention to it the verse 24 makes a connection to as the church submits to christ so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything the church was founded by christ and Christ has guidelines and rules and regulations that govern the church and the church is expected to obey those rules and guidelines and follow whatever Christ has said. It's saying that in the same vein, the wife should submit to the husbands in everything. So the husband is supposed to be the head of the family as the Bible rightly said. The husband is supposed to define the scope of operation. He's supposed to move the family in a way that God desires because the man is supposed to look up to Christ as Christ looks up to God because the wife is looking up to the man. So one of the requirements of a man is that you should hear the voice of God like we said. So the wife material should also be able to discern that this man actually hears from God because I'm supposed to be following him. I'm supposed to be living in the context of whatever he has set so that I'll be able to submit. But is he someone who is listening to from God? Is this someone who can hear from God? Is this someone who is doing whatever God has called him to do? If those things are not checked, you realize that you enter the marriage and the man is doing whatever he wants to do. And now you are trying to react to whatever the man is doing. And that is equally wrong because Bible did not give you that leeway that when the man is misbehaving, do not submit. So the devil traps people in marriages because he makes one party misbehaves. And then you are also going to react based on how the person is living his or her life. And it is wrong. Ignorance is no excuse. You might not know, but it does not take away the effect. So I pray that from today, we will open up our spirit more. We will learn, we will have knowledge so that we will not be destroyed. Then the 25 begins to elaborate on how the husband is supposed to deal with the woman. He said, husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. This is a very strong scripture. The standard or the bar that God is using to measure how the man deals with the wife is that he said, this is how Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Before we come to how the man is supposed to love the wife, let's see how Christ loved the church. Christ's love for the church was unconditional. Christ gave up himself that the church will be redeemed. He left all his riches in heaven, came down, took upon himself our sin and became poor so that we would be rich. We did not call him to come and save us, but because he loved us so much, he didn't even need us to invite him to come and save us. And this is the bar that we are comparing a husband's love to the wife with. As Christ loved the church, the church is me is you is your relatives we form the church and you know or you are convinced and you believe with me that the church has all sort of people all sort of people every single vice can be found in the church but god has still not given up on us his love for the church is unconditional he died for every single person that if you begin to accept him as your lord and personal savior he will actually save you this is the kind of love we are talking about. This is the kind of love we are expecting a husband to show the wife. Unconditional. Because Christ loved the church unconditional, he wasn't selective. We expect that the man will love the wife unconditional. No matter what the wife will do, the covenant the man has about marriage is with God. This is what God is saying. And God did not give any exemptions. He did not say in his word that love your wife when they cook for you. He didn't say love your wife when they attend to your needs. He didn't say love your wife when they submit to you. The covenant God has with the woman is different and the covenant God has with the man is also different. So you do not play your part of the bargain based on how your wife is responding. Christ was ready to give up his life for the church. He sacrificed 
everything for the sake of the church. The kind of love we are talking about here is that of sacrificial love. That you will put your life before the line to make sure that your spouse is okay. Christ was married to the church and Christ made sure that at his, the peril of his life, he was ready to give it all up so that the church will be free. He came to deliver the church from the oppression and the frustrations of the devil. He came so that he will make the church a holy church without wrinkles and spots. This gives us an indication that the church was in a mess. The church was not holy. The church was with wrinkles and spots all over. The Bible makes me understand that Jesus was able to deliver the church by cleansing the church with God's word. This is an indication that God's word is a detergent. When the spots and wrinkles are there and you put in God's word, it begins to absorb and deliver you from all those spots and wrinkles. So whatever impurities you have, whatever sinful life you are living, whatever unrighteousness that is embedded in your heart, when the word of God comes through for you, you will become a holy, spotless, and a blameless person in the name of Jesus. Verse 28 goes on to make a very interesting scene and he says, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Because the two become one. And Paul is saying that the two becoming one is a mystery. So if I am one with my wife, whatever I am doing to my wife, I'm actually doing it to myself. If I insult my wife, I've insulted myself. That understanding makes us begin to deal with our spouses in a very godly manner. So husbands, deal with your wife, seeing that your wife is actually you. Because we are one, the two have become one. So when you rain insults on your wife, you're actually insulting yourself. If you don't take care of your wife and your wife steps out there and is looking all tattered, it is an indication of who you are. The real definition of a man is what your wife looks like. When we see your wife outside, it tells us who you are. Because Bible is saying that they are one. They are one. So once we are one, when anyone sees your wife out there, the way they look, their demeanor, their spiritual life, their composure, their attitude, their character, it defines who the man is. So the man must spend time in trying to make the woman what he desires the woman to be in line with God's word. So Jesus came on earth, lived with us, and tried to work with us to make us what he designs us to be. No wonder in the days of old, the disciples were called Christians. The Christians came out of the fact that the people saw Christ in them. That is what the husband is supposed to be. So when people see the church, they see God. So be careful out there how you are living your life as a believer. Somebody will wrongly define God because of the way you are living your life. Somebody will see God because of the way you are living your life. If the people of old could see the disciples and said, these ones are Christians because they've lived with Christ, it ties it in, into whatever we are talking about here, that your body is the same as the woman. So whatever happens to the woman is actually a reflection of you. So when people see your wife out there and they are raining insults on her because of how she behaves or how she is, that is who you are. But when everybody is praising your wife out there and giving thanks to God, the credit goes to you. So one of the achievements of a godly husband or a good husband is that when people see your wife, they should be able to see a change. Because when they come in, they are coming with spots and wrinkles. But after Jesus dealt with the church and came to stay with the church and made sure that everything was right with the church, we became without spots or wrinkles. So when you marry, after a while, when you begin to wash your wife's spots and the wrinkles and the unholiness with God's word, people will begin to see a change. So the cardinal point of a successful husband is that the wife has changed from her ungodly ways, her unholy ways. Her spots and her wrinkles are beginning to diminish, are beginning to get 
ironed out. People should see your wife and say, oh my goodness, she looks so much better today. She, she, her, her character has changed. She's now a very calm and a very patient person from what we knew her before. Then the man is doing some work. When you become a believer, the cardinal point is change. Everybody sees you and will know that something has happened to you. So when your wife stays with you for a couple of months and years and there is no change, unfortunately, you have failed as a husband. According to what God's word is saying, that no one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. So if your own body is your wife, you must care for it. You cannot hate your body and feed it. So because you love it, you must take care of it. So that's why the condition was, husbands love your wives. So when you love her, you will take care of her. When you love her, you will treat her well. When you love her, you will protect and guide her. You will polish her and make her be whatever God has designed her to be. The problem of men is to love their women. That was why God emphatically stated that husbands should love. So we need to work on that thing. We need to work hard at it. It's not easy. It doesn't come easy. That's why God said love. So don't take it for granted and you think love is easy. No. Just like the way submission is not easy for women, love is not easy for men. God knew where our problems are. That's why he pointed it out to us. So we will work on it. So when the woman begins to learn and develop herself in the submission bit, for the husband and the husband also is doing that on the other side to love the wife unconditionally they begin to move together and that is how the cleaving comes in so the moving is because the woman is ready to submit the man is ready to love and then it attracts them together when they come together they cleave and find and form a perfect fit so the living and cleaving these are the reasons why you must live and cleave when you are ready to submit as a wife and the husband is ready to love unconditionally, then you can cleave. That is how God designed it to be. As a husband, being the head of the home doesn't mean that you're supposed to be bullying your wife. The type of headship we are talking about here is one of a servant leadership. Christ was the perfect example. He was the head of the church, but he came to give his life up for the church. He came to die for us. He was not autocratic. What he was doing was that he would share whatever he wants to do with us and encourage us to do it. Christ didn't come to demonstrate a selfish form of leadership where he's just pushing his agendas. He gave us enough room to adjust. He gave us enough encouragement. He was actually helping us to obey the things that he said. And he didn't even force it. He gave us our willpower to be able to decide whether to do it or not. And even when we decided not to do it, he still had room for us to repent. He still had room for us to come back. He did not sideline us. He did not leave us. He did not divorce the church because the church was being recalcitrant. So the man has no reason to say that I'm sick and tired, I'm fed up with you, so leave my house. No matter what the woman does, you're supposed to love her unconditionally. It's a covenant between the man and God, unconditionally. Give the woman enough room to change. Create that conducive atmosphere for the woman to be able to submit to you. So the man must be able to live a particular life that will make submission from the wife come out natural. When you love your wife, submission comes automatic. You don't demand for it, you will earn it. Unfortunately, most of the men out there, we are demanding submission from our wives. And you don't submit. Bible is saying that you need to submit to me as the man. But the question is, and I mean the real question is, are you loving her? That is your part of the covenant. Are you loving her? But you are rather demanding submission. You don't demand anything. You only give what you are supposed to give. And the other party comes in to fulfill their part of the bargain. Women are there and they are screaming and ranting. You don't love me. Bible said you should love me, but you don't love me. The real question here again is, are you a submissive person? You can't be shouting at a man and expect him to love you. No. 
when a woman submits to the husband she's actually massaging the man's ego making the man know understand and feel that he is the head of the house just as god has designed it to be and the man automatically will love you when you submit automatic sub automatic love will come from the man and when you love your wife she would automatically submit to you she can do anything to make sure that the marriage works the christian man should be spiritually mature and demonstrate enough knowledge of god's word for the women to be willing to also follow them because you are the head of the house and how is the wife going to follow you if you are not demonstrating anything so instead of rather demanding that the wife should submit you work on yourself to be able to be spiritually alert for the woman to be able to understand and pick that my husband is doing the right thing when the woman is able to pick that she will submit naturally and follow the teachings and the guidance that you are bringing for the family that is how it's supposed to go jesus was compared to the man and the church as the wife whatever directions or directives jesus gave when he was on earth was in our interest was for our own welfare he wished that well he wanted us to become better people so he wasn't forcing it on us he had our welfare at heart that is how the man is supposed to be whatever directions that you are bringing in your marriage whatever whatever you are trying to get your wife into it should be for their welfare it shouldn't be something that is going to suppress them it shouldn't be something that is going to take them out of god's will but have their welfare at heart and that is how the fine balance comes in. When the woman is able to understand and feel that you have their welfare at heart, they begin to yield and everything else begins to gel properly. So you realize that we've been trying to sew a beautiful dress this morning. The man on one part and the woman on one part, we've tried to highlight the things that the woman is supposed to do and that of the man as well. So we've cut out the two pieces separately and then we merged it so that living and cleaving had not come to fruition. And you realize that because we've been able to highlight what the man is supposed to do and what the woman is supposed to do before they leave and cleave, now that they are going to cleave, the dress is beautiful according to the way God wants it. So Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 to 33 actually shows a beautiful institution of marriage. As long as the woman is willing to be submissive without conditions, just like the church submits to Christ, and the man is willing to love the wife just like Christ loved the church and was ready to give himself up for it, you have heaven on earth. That is how God wanted it to be. The woman should understand that she's coming with issues and the man should also know that she, he's going to deal with issues with the man, the, with the woman. But the point is, he is going to cleanse the woman with God's word. How much of God's word are you studying? How much of a devotion are you having? How much of time do you have with God? How much intimacy do you have with God as a man? Because part of your requirement is that you must cleanse your wife with God's word. How much of the word of God do you know? So knowledge of God's word by a husband is non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. Because you will need it to help heal your wife. You will need it to help cleanse your wife from the spot. You will need it to iron out the wrinkles in your wife's life. It's non-negotiable women when you are seeking partners make sure you are looking out for these qualities men when you are seeking partners make sure that the woman is somebody who can be submissive it's part of what god has told them to be and once the marriage is carefully knit together and it becomes a beautiful piece you realize that this is heaven on earth if you can submit as a woman and you can love as a man, that is how God has designed it to be. At the end of it all, don't forget, the foundation of this marriage covenant is that both parties must submit themselves unto God out of reverence. A threefold cord is not easily broken. The man is on one extreme, the woman is on the other, and God is at the apex of it. So I am not dealing with you based on what you are doing to me. I'm dealing with you based on how I see God at the apex. And as we begin to connect to God, eventually we come together. 
So I see my wife through the lens of Christ. So by the time I would want to react, as I look at Christ, I begin to respond. What I'm trying to say is reaction is instantaneous. We don't think, we don't reason through it. But response is when you take your time, you calm down and you think through it. So as I look at God, my mind begins to get transformed. I begin to see my wife in the context of God's word, how I'm supposed to deal with her. And the same thing happens with the wife. So it is very important to note this thing. The standard here is about God. It's not about you. And we must see our spouse in the lens of God. Because if you look at her, you will miss it. God has a way he's seeing the person. So you must also be in alignment with God to see the person in that same direction. Else you would abuse people that are supposed to be a blessing to you. May God add his blessings to today's study. I pray that somebody will be delivered from making a wrong choice today. I pray that somebody's mind will be renewed and transformed today in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the words that we've spoken carry your spirit out there. Deliver your children. Make them better people. And as they get into that institution that you formed, may all the blessings therein be their portion. We bless you. We glorify your name and ask that your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, fellow listeners. As always, continue to share the word and play your part as evangelist. May God bless and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.